Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm not sure I'm very smart, and I'm very sure I'm not very exciting, but I'll try and be both uh, today as I, as I present. Um, it was funny. I came downstairs uh, for breakfast this morning, and I started practicing my talk today. Uh, hi, my name is James Willis. And then my six-year-old said, blah, 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 no one cares. Uh, so, uh, so what I'm going to try and do is I understand, I under which is true. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to try and uh, I'm going to sort of go off my script a little bit because I'm going to try and make you care, but I also realize I'm standing between you and lunch, so um, I'm cognizant of that. And then I turned to my wife su for support, uh, and she said, you know, the problem with you academics is you just don't talk the language of practitioners, and you don't understand the challenges we face. So I was dismissed by uh, two women in my household. The third one was silent. So I had thought a lot about that fact, actually, because I'm going to be talking about organizational change. And I do think a lot what it must be like, even though I'm not in uh, a police department, what it must be like to try and institution institutionalize change. So I wrestled with that. And I do have a slide. I went to the literature. And I was like, well, what, is, what does the literature tell us about what factors might uh, help initiate successful change? Um, and as I thought about that a little bit more and I wrestled with it, uh, I realized I have Daryl Stevens on the panel today. And I could just pass the buck, and he might focus a little bit more upon that aspect of policing, how to initiate uh, change. Um, so what I'm going to do today, and I'm going to try and do it much more briefly. I had about 25 minutes here, but I'm going to try and do it in about 10. Uh, and maybe I'll be throwing out sort of themes will be more important to me than sort of a coherent narrative in terms of a talk. But I've been thinking a little bit about, well, how can you integrate reforms? Uh, and the sort of the starting point here, and a lot of this work has come from talking and working with my colleague Steve Mastrovsky and Tammy Reinhardt Koschel, where we tend to think of reforms as sort of independent and separate. We don't tend to think of them as sort of opportunities for integrating them or making them sort of mutually reinforcing. Um, and so what I wanted to do today is sort of lay out a little bit of a model for you, uh, some ideas where you might start thinking about, well, where in our own agencies are there opportunities uh, to integrate some reforms? And I'm going to use that sort of thinking or that line of inquiry. I'm going to illustrate it with uh, two reforms, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with which is ComStat and community policing. And hopefully, by the end of this presentation, uh, you know, I can tell my six-year-old that you actually did care uh, about what I had to say. Um, so one of the things that how we tend to think of reform is, is I'm going to call it the wave model. Um, that when these, these sort of big reform ideas sort of come down the pipe, a bit like evidence-based policing, and we think of them as sort of washing away everything that preceded them. And keeping sort of this aquatic theme, um, we can even see that in the kind of language that, that's used. And here I'm using the illustration of Comstat, where it's talked about as sort of a, a new paradigm or a sea change in policing. And you can even think about uh, the evolving strategy of policing, the sort of the short article by Kelling and Moore, where even though they don't intend it to be sort of a, a, a literal interpretation of history, it's a heuristic device, but they talk about these sort of three different eras of policing like sort of the professional reform model and, and uh, the community model and these kinds of things, which sort of plants the seed that you know, one wave then replaces another wave. Now, I'm going to argue a little bit that that conceptualization is something that we should fight against when we're thinking of reform. And so I identified three sort of harmful consequences of this kind of wave model. Unrealistic expectations for success, both inside and outside the police department. So if things don't change radically, we become frustrated and become cynical. A lack of attention to potential implementation problems, right? By not thinking about sort of what we have now and what's coming and how these might integrate or not integrate with one another, we might ignore some of the problems that might occur. And this is where I'm going to tend to sort of focus today is we might overlook opportunities for co-implementation, for integrating existing reforms with new ideas that are coming in. Because we all know realistically that the wave is not going to wash away everything that's come before. So these are some ways to think about sort of expanding the possibilities of practice. And I'm going to use comp standing community policing here. So uh, I have to thank Julie Willis, uh, who's uh, one of the scholars affiliated with CBCP, for helping me come up with these slides. And so through conversations with colleagues, perhaps it's a better way to sort of think or conceptualize change as, as a sort of sedimentary model, where changes come in and they're very much shaped by the things that have come before them. And when you start to think like that, you think like, well, how might I integrate, say this is community-oriented policing or community-oriented policing and comps, that how might I think about they could be shaped or uh, coupled together in ways that might give us efficiency gains, which is Daryl Stevens' uh, term. What we found when we did our research on comps that 
is that those features of CompStat that seem to meld very well with existing structures got reinforced. So CompStat tends to reinforce the traditional command hierarchy we found when we go to sites. Uh, you especially see that in CompStat meetings where you have a chief posing questions to a district commander. The chief has ideas about what should be happening and the district commander is then held accountable for achieving those goals or objectives. But things that would radically change the organization or cause it to change more significantly or doesn't agree with existing structures and practices we're less likely to change, like innovative problem solving. So just as a sort of conceptual way of thinking, it might be worth thinking of change in terms of this model rather than the wave model. Now I'm not going to uh, test your patience by reading the slide about what CompStat and community policing are, but these are the ways that we have chosen to define them. And when you think of reforms this way, it can be hard to think of ways that they might be integrated. Right? We just have some definitions here, some key ideas. And I think this is one reason why when we went to different police departments and we said to people, hey, you know, how does CompStat and community policing work in your police department? Most people were kind of baffled by the question and they would end up answering, well, this is how CompStat operates and this is how community policing operates. And I don't think that's the fault of the police by any means. I think it's a tendency to think of reforms in terms of their individual merits and weaknesses, right? So problem-oriented policing or hotspots policing, well, what is it? What does it do? We don't think so much with, well, what does, how does it couple with existing structures and practices? And I know that Cynthia and Chris do think a lot about this. And this is an area I think that's worth developing. Again, I just focus on CompStat um, and community policing. So one challenge is, well, how would you start to think or envision? So if I had more time, I could go around the room and say, well, where do you think there are areas of compatibility? Where are there some differences? And maybe over time, we could come to a consensus. I think that's an important starting point for this kind of thing. Otherwise, it's just sort of simply overwhelming. It's too dense. It needs clarity. And so this is what we started to think about. We broke them down into these reform elements. And it helped for us to sort of see, well, where are there some, con some consistencies or compatibilities and where are some uh, inconsistencies? And so the dark areas is where we sort of felt like there were the greatest differences until you go down to the light area where we felt like there was sort of the greatest compatibility. Now, I haven't got time to go through each of these and explain our reasoning behind them. We could certainly debate them. If you look inside your, your workbook, which is a wonderful term, it's like you know, children have workbooks, and we all have workbooks as well. We have homework tonight, uh, even though it's the summer. Um, you can see sort of a little bit more detail about the kinds of recommendations we make, um, and you can go to the COPS website if you're interested in sort of more details about how we come up with this. Um, basically, most of these are self-explanatory. Mission clarification, sort of the core values of the organization, the fundamental business of the business, Internal accountability, how do you hold people accountable for their performance? Decentralization of decision making, delegating authority for making decisions about when and how to mobilize down the rank structure. Organizational flexibility, how do you develop a capacity to change routines, to move resources to where they're needed most? And most of you know, like any large organization, police departments are very bureaucratic. It's hard to change those routines. There's benefits to those routines. Right? It gives us consistency. Uh, Data-driven problem identification and assessment. Um, how do you use data to identify where problems are occurring? A big source uh, uh, of importance to um, hotspots policing. External accountability. How does the department make its efforts visible to people outside the department and create a collaborative environment? And what's the sort of level of creative or innovative problem solving or thinking where you're going beyond the kinds of things that you usually do to tackle crime problems? Anyway, so this helped us think about where these sort of possibilities or potentials for integration might lie. How am I doing? Okay. This is an evidence-based conference, so I figured I'd better have a slide with some evidence on it. Um, we went to seven police departments. We had a national survey. We did interviews and observations. I won't go into all the details of the study. But what we basically found is that these reforms were stovepiped. I think that's a, that's a good visual. That was uh, Steve's term. They sort of work in parallel and they don't cross. They work separately. Um, and what a department gets is, you know, it gets different things from these different reforms. Okay. And so it sort of can hit to a number of different bases. So COPS was interested in that finding and said, well, how about you, you make some recommendations for us? Right? which put me in a very unpleasant position of actually having to think a bit more like a practitioner and thinking, well, what, what would work? You know, what's not fanciful thinking or pie in the sky? What could we come up with 
that you know, a police chief or a sergeant or a patrol officer could look at and say, well, that's not pie in the sky. I can see your reasoning behind that. It might be challenging to implement, right, as change always is. Um, but I can see the basis for those recommendations. Now, these are in the workbook. So one place I can kind of cut a lot of time is here. And I think what I'd choose to do is let you know a little bit about our thinking. So I've been to many ComStat meetings over the years, and uh, I've seen many people's eyes glazed over during those meetings as they go on for two or three hours. And they become really a, a reporting. I'm sure many of you would agree with me. Uh, oftentimes, there's useful things that go on, but primarily they can become a, a kind of venue for reporting, where the chief gets sort of keyed in on the kinds of things that his district commanders or precinct commanders are doing, uh, what crime rates are, you know, month to month, you know, year to date, these kinds of things. What you seldom see, and this might be different in some of your departments, but you seldom see sort of anything really spoken about or discussed about community policing. So it seemed to us that there was an opportunity there to introduce sort of some of the values of community policing into ComStat meetings. And so what you could have, if you wanted to, is you would not only hold your district commanders accountable for talking about sort of the serious crime in their districts or areas, but you could also have them talk about some of the community policing concerns in their areas. Now importantly, those community policing problems would be problems identified by members of the community, not by the police. So you'd have to have some kind of uh, mechanism in place that would allow you to surface those concerns. So that was one thing that we thought about, which would be a way of integrating community policing values into the mission uh, of, of, Com of ComStat and vice versa. And then you could also create some performance measures. Now, most police departments are very adept at, at collecting statistics on crime. You've had long experience of doing that, uh, part one crimes, calls for service. It's a little bit more challenging um, collecting statistics or measures of CUNY policing performance. Right? Maybe Wes Scogan, although he wouldn't recommend this, he says it's so challenging, but you could have community surveys, perhaps given out to a representative sample of people in the district, and there could be measures there of community policing performance. It could be about community problems in the district, it could be about um, satisfaction with police performance. It's up to your department what it chose, chose to measure. Those could then be integrated into ComStat meetings. Um, those are those two things. One of the things that uh, we thought a little bit about, and this probably comes about that there's, there's not a very well-developed accountability mechanism that is built into community policing. Um, and of course, ComStat, I would probably argue that the strongest element of ComStat is this accountability mechanism. Putting people in front of a, a group of their peers and asking them how they're doing is a very strong, forceful accountability mechanism in most police departments. Even if the department's sort of touchy-feely and friendly, which is what you hear about when you go to a lot of departments, or we don't like the New York Police Department model, it's too harsh, it won't fit with the culture here. I think even if you're very generous in those meetings, just the fact you're putting someone in a meeting and asking them about their performance you know, is a relatively strong accountability mechanism. But with ComStat, the spike of accountability, because of that, tends to get pushed down just to the level of middle managers. And it becomes much more diffuse after that. At least that's what we found. So it might be worthwhile trying to figure out ways that you can make accountability more pronounced for people lower down in the organization. And one way, I think, is to make beat level officers accountable to the public they serve. And you can do that by geographically assigning them. This is what they did in Chicago, where they created these permanent beat teams. And when those beat teams had to go to meetings and report on the things that they were doing, they felt a strong sense of accountability to those communities because they could be questioned and queried in the same ways that you'd find at department level ComStat meetings. You could also, if you had, did something like this, you could also then hold district level ComStat meetings. And this came out of a visit to the LAPD where the district commander would have these district level meetings with some of his specialist units um, or other units that were assigned to him. And he would be asking questions just like it was a department-wide ComStat meeting. And he would ask his sergeants, well, what are you doing about this? What are you doing about that? And that was another way of pushing accountability a little bit further down the organization. So sergeants and patrol officers felt that you know, they were being held accountable for the kinds of efforts that they were showing on the street in terms of reducing cr crime. This sort of goes back to the, uh, I've only got a few more slides now, it goes back to the sort of glazed eyes comment. Um, where really, because the department's gone for very long and there's a lot of people there that perhaps don't feel that they should be involved, I think there's an opportunity to focus ComStat meetings in a more strategic way. It really depends upon what you want to get out of your ComStat meetings. And the vision that we had when we were thinking about this is a much smaller meeting with key personnel, crime analysts, maybe some sort of um, 
You can even invite a local criminologist if you found like they had something useful to offer. Um, you could even incorporate something like Larry Sherman's evidence-based cop, where there's someone there who's responsible for bringing sort of research literature and synthesizing it and explaining it to people. But what we envision would be a more sort of a brainstorming, focusing on big, big deal problems, really major issues that are going on in the district, um, and then exchanging ideas, using research, querying assumptions. So a much more sort of like a think tank atmosphere than something that's more performative, which is how Comstat tends to be. And I think if you lengthen the period between Comstat meetings, perhaps not two weeks or four weeks, but maybe to say every quarter, and you could have another mechanism in place if you felt kind of awkward with that, you wanted something a little bit more constant, um, it might be that then people feel even more accountable. They've had more time to think about a problem, right? And so you can actually, instead of decreasing accountability that way, you might actually be heightening accountability. Well, you've had two months to think about this. What, what kinds of things are you doing? So that might be another thing uh, to think about. Of course, one of the things that you have to think about then is do you lose sort of that performative aspect of comps that I think can be quite important because you can point to it in newspapers and say, look at these wonderful meetings, look at the glitzy um, data that's being flashed on the screen, right? Um, and it might be that this no longer really looks like the way that people think CompStat should be. So, but I think it's a bold move, and if you're really interested in sort of making CompStat meetings more effective in terms of coming up with innovative solutions, this is probably a better way to go, um, rather than focusing on the small stuff and just reporting out uh, for, for, for a couple of hours. James, yeah. You know, we didn't focus on this uh, in terms of, uh, it wasn't a, a large part of the study, but when you get to patrol officers, even if they rotate through, because they don't really go and they're not involved and they don't speak, uh, you know, they, they don't really feel very strongly about them or feel they're particularly useful in many cases, right? Um, one, one guy said to us, uh, if, you, if you don't go, you don't know, right? So um, I think there's room to perhaps sell CompStat in a way where it's more relevant to people at the street level. Uh, and maybe when I come to the last slide which is coming up, that might help, that might give that a context in terms of what kind of change you're looking for and the best way to implement change. That basically I think line level officers feel pretty ignored when it comes to CompStat. Uh, and if they hear about CompStat is as a directive from above about what they should be doing. Um, really not kind of a textured assessment of what went on in the meeting. Right, and the brainstorming that went on and the different ideas that were coming up and those kinds of things. Um, yeah? Have you actually uh, seen an agency that has a concept where this eye grant plays so much? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And where would that be? Uh, well, I'd rather not name names, but I mean, I, I think just like in this room, right, if you're there for two and a half hours, you know, and you don't feel directly involved or implicated in any way, um, it can be hard to maintain your attention. I think. I mean, I don't mean to be uh, flippant with my criticisms, but I, I, I think that, um, you know, if there's n it's not really clearly laid out what the purpose of the meeting is. Like, if people were honest, I think they'd say it's a way for people to be made to feel, to feel accountable, right? And for us to kind of know what's going on in the organization. But there's 50 people in the room, and some people might not speak, and it might be not their district that's presenting. And so if time is so valuable, there might be opportunities to sort of change it to a format where you know, it's more creative, people feel more, more involved, they feel like their input's important, um, and that the outcomes that you're seeking are more than just accountability, that you're really looking for crime prevention. So um, a lot of the times they run so long. Some places I went to ran three hours. And then you got the preparation time too. So many district commanders would say it was like preparing for a test. So, you know, you, you kind of put all your other work aside, and then you cram, and the kinds of questions you get asked are on details, right? So it's like, uh, well, tell me about that case that happened on that street, right? And then the district commander has to be familiar with all the cases. Well, I'm not so sure that sort of melds well with strategic problem solving, where he or she might be looking at crime hotspots, trends over time. What's the major issue, right? This case is important. Maybe I'll ask one question about that. But what's the major issue? Well, I've got a problem with burglaries. I've had this problem for three months. What are some of the things that you've been doing about it? You know, how can we help you? Have you gone to look at pop center guides? You know, uh, have you talked to a local criminologist? You know, I've tried all these things. These, you know, that I think would be a more fruitful kind of exchange if you're looking for strategy. Um, okay. Um,
so this is my penultimate slide. Always a good word to use when you, you kind of got cotton ball mouth. Um, and so one of the things I wanted to think about and sort of convey to you is if you wanted to go somewhere, some of these might seem kind of intuitive that you already know, but this was an article that sort of outlined some of the elements that you would need <coughs> to consider if you're trying to implement successful change. Um, this is something that I'm sort of a growing area of interest of mine is like how do you really change organizations? And so you can look at this um, and see some of these, as I said, seem pretty intuitive. Part of my thinking about this, and I won't go through each one of these, is that change is very challenging and oftentimes um, people try and change very rapidly. And part of what this was sort of arguing in this, this piece is that it's good to try and anticipate where resistance might come. I'm working on another grant with uh, Chris Coper and Cynthia Lum at the moment about technology and how it changes organizations. And oftentimes the research literature says a lot about this. Um, people have different expectations about how technology will change the organization and oftentimes they don't meet. So, um, you know, it might be worth anticipating that. So if I bring Comstat in, you know, what role a patrol officer is going to play? Well, it's going to be a small role. Uh, okay, well, how are they going to learn about Comstat then? Well, it'll be as a directive from above. Well, how well does that fit with my community policing strategy, which is encouraging them to become autonomous and independent in terms of their decision making? Well, it seems like there's a bit of a disconnect. Well, it might be that the officers feel like they're getting conflicting messages, which is what we found in one department that, that we visited. So here are some sort of highlights about how you might want to sort of implement successful change. And I think Daryl's going to speak a little bit more about that, given his, his lengthy uh, and rich experience in policing. Am I, I'm doing pretty well. Okay. Um, so what have I tried to do here? Well, I've tried to say, hey, you know, Think conceptualize reform not as a wave, but sort of a model where different reforms come in and shaped by what comes before them. Um, there might be that, especially in these tough economic times, there's opportunities for integration um, that you know, are being missed. And you might get sort of more bang for your buck if you think about the way that you can make different reforms sort of mutually reinforcing. It's worth being mindful of, well, how do these reforms fit with things that are already in existence? We already know that patrol is going to carry on pretty much how it always has been with reactive and preventive patrol. It's our largest resource. Well, can we take that into account if we're moving to a model where we're going to be integrating CompStat and community policing? What would it mean for that? Are we going to you know, change that sort of role that patrol plays? Are we going to do hotspots policing? And then the last slide was obviously urging to think carefully about organizational change, how to communicate it, things that you might want to put in place to ensure that obstacles can be overcome. 